Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrea. It feels very formal to be called a keynote speaker. Uh, so thank you. Bear with me. Have low expectations. Uh, I'm really here, and I'm delighted to be here. It's such an honor to be asked to speak to you. Just a quick show of hands. How many people are actually from Ottawa? Who lives in Ottawa? Okay, so about two-thirds of the folks. Well, thank you. Thank you from, for those of you who are here from Ottawa. Uh, I'm hoping that you hear some great stuff that the city is doing, and then you challenge us with some other things you'd like to see us do. And if you're not from Ottawa, then I'm hoping you've got some ideas we can steal from you. So, so please uh, share some of the successes that you've had or lessons that you've learned with us so that we can learn from you. We're really blessed to learn from many other municipalities and other organizations across the country. And this is such a significant challenge we're facing that we really do need everyone to be involved. So, uh, Ottawa's climate goals. So I'm gonna give about a 20 minute presentation. It's an overview of what the city of Ottawa has been doing over the last number of years. Very high level, very general. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of technical things, so if you have questions, please uh, save them and we'll have time at the end to go through some questions. So Ottawa, like many other municipalities, institutions, and levels of government, declared a climate emergency in 2019. Since then, we have faced a number of climate events from flooding to tornadoes. We've had multiple heat waves at both ends of the spectrum in the spring and into the fall. We've had the ice storms. And of course, last year for the first time, we really experienced wildfire smoke in a way that we hadn't in the Ottawa Valley in my lifetime. And every one of these conversations, or sorry, every one of these events has really led to a lot of conversations, both with our politicians and our families and our neighbors. It's really brought climate change to the forefront for a lot of people, and it's really changed the kind of conversations we've been having since 2019 about the role that the city of Ottawa can play as a municipality and the role that individuals, businesses, and institutions within our cities play to address climate change. Ottawa has a climate change master plan. If you're from Ottawa, have you, has anybody read this amazing document? Anybody? Oh, well, a couple, a couple. You're, you're kind, thank you. The Climate Change Master Plan is the City of Ottawa's uh, priorities over the next five years, sorry, uh, up until 2025. It was approved in 2020, and it set out five years of priorities to deal with both mitigation and adaptation. So, of course, when we're talking about mitigation, we're talking about how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in this case, we're really talking about avoiding the unmanageable. We're trying to keep emissions down low to avoid the changes that we'll see in our climate. And on the adaptation side, we're really trying to build resiliency to the changes that we are already seeing and the more uh, profound changes which we know are coming. And in this case, we're looking to manage the unavoidable. So what's Ottawa's climate gonna look like? We worked with the National Capital Commission and Environment Climate Change Canada, and to some extent, La uh, Ville Gatineau, and we looked at what uh, the city's climate would look like by 2050. And we modeled this over a couple of different emission scenarios, and we came up with some pretty important data that has implications for our infrastructure, our natural systems, our economy, and our individual uh, community systems, our social fabric. A couple of the things I'm gonna point out from these, uh, these images, which you can find on ottawa.ca, is that we're gonna see four times more days over 30 degrees in Ottawa by 2050. Right now, we average about 11 days over 30 degrees. We're on track for 44 by 2050. That has significant implications, particularly because there are a number of buildings in Ottawa that don't have air conditioning. Long-term care facilities, apartment buildings, schools. So we're on a trajectory for some very hot days, and we're already seeing trends towards that. Uh, I'm a skier. 
uphill and down, and we are on track for 35% uh, fewer days below minus 10. And we're talking about 20% less snowfall. So we're going to see our region change. We got a bit of a taste of that, I think, this winter. But certainly overall, we're looking at warmer, wetter, and wilder. On the, the rain side of things, we're anticipating about 8 more percent rain in a year. And for specific rain events, about 15% wetter. Some of you may remember the August 10th event of last year where we had flooding in a number of areas in the city. That was an example of an extreme rain event that we are going to see more, uh, more frequently in Ottawa. So once we worked with the National Capital Commission and Environment Canada to model out what the climate would look like by 2050, we also then did a study to look at where are we the most vulnerable and where do we have the highest risks in Ottawa. So they get summarized at a very high level here with extreme heat, more rainfall, changing seasons, and extreme weather. Some of those are related to the examples that I just had. But again, it really touches on a wide swath of aspects, our infrastructure, our natural systems, our economy, and our community systems, our social fabric. So on the emission side of things, we have targets that have been set by council to reduce emissions in line with global agreements to hold temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius. In the orange, we have our corporate emission reduction targets, and those are things that are under the direct control of the municipality. Think about the city operations, the things that we have for our, uh, the emissions that we generate through our buildings, our fleet, our um, uh, water and wastewater treatment plants, et cetera. So Ottawa, as a corporation, has set targets to reduce our emissions 100% by 2040. And those are the ones that we have direct control over. We're on track right now. Ottawa is meeting our 2025. We're, we're currently exceeding it slightly uh, to meet our corporate target of reducing it, our emissions 30% by 2025. That, of course, could change with a whole number of factors. And it's a big jump to get from 30% to 50% by uh, 2030. But by 2040, the goal is to be 100% reduced below 2012 uh, levels on the corporate side. Community-wide, Ottawa as a corporation only has about 5% of the emissions. So Ottawa only has direct control about, of about 5% of all emissions in the city of Ottawa at large. So the community emissions make up 95% of our emissions in Ottawa. They are much more substantial much more challenging to meet. We are not on track to meet our 2025 targets. We would need to have reductions of five to 6% every year between now and 2030 if we're going to hit um, even our 2025 targets at this point. Community emissions break down at a very high level. About 90% of emissions in Ottawa are from buildings and transportation. Unlike other uh, municipalities or other areas in Canada, we don't have much industry here in Ottawa. So about 90% of our emissions is coming from existing buildings and transportation. Uh, more than half of our emissions are coming specifically from natural gas and gasoline. On the city operations side of things, most of our emissions come from our bus fleet, our transit fleet. Um, and most of our emissions are coming specifically from diesel. And we're making big progress on that in our transition to our e-bus fleet that I'll talk about in a minute. Oh, I already gave the punchline away for this one. This, is, uh, this shows how far off track we are on our community emissions. We're not on track, as I said, by hitting that uh, first target of 43 emission reductions by 2025. We are on track, we're just below on the 30% for our uh, city operations, our corporate emissions. Um, we've only got 2020 data up right here in case anyone is curious. We will be coming out with the 2021 and 2022 data in the near future. We went back and are doing a third party peer review. There's 
as many in the room who are working in this space knows, methodologies are continuously changing, and we've gone back to do a third-party review to validate some of the methodologies we've been using, and once that's been confirmed, we'll come out with the 2021-2022 inventories for both the corporate emissions and the community ones. So if we're trying to get to 100% reduction by 2050, community at large, here are the big buckets that uh, our model for it called energy evolution uh, shows how we can meet those targets. No surprise, many of those emissions are related to buildings and transportation. So starting at the bottom, new buildings, if we're building to higher building codes or we're bringing in high performance development standards, we anticipate that's about 8% of where we can achieve our emissions. Existing buildings, residential, commercial, institutional, we're looking, at, that's, the, that's uh, the biggest, one of the biggest uh, wedges in that graph, um, looking for about 30% of our emission reductions coming from retrofits uh, in existing buildings. Looking at waste and renewable natural gas, or RNG, about 17% of emissions could come from that, and that's a combination of waste through our, our corporate operations and community waste, and same for renewable natural gas. It's renewable natural gas that we could either create through our own water and wastewater treatment plants, our landfills, or through private landfills. And then transportation sector, this deals with private vehicles and commercial fleets, as well as a very small component in, in this graph for the City of Ottawa fleet, as well as our transit system. And last but not least, electricity. And this is really reflective of the provincial grid and uh, where gains would need to be made at the provincial level in order to reduce emissions for that roughly 8%. So top five actions to reduce greenhouse gases in Ottawa at the community scale. Number one is electrifying personal vehicles. It represents about 20% of that 37% transportation wedge, electrifying uh, personal vehicles. Retrofitting existing buildings. Um, that, that was part of that one at the bottom, that 30% down there. That's where we've got a big chunk to do. Diverting organics and creating renewable natural gas, that was about 17% on the last slide. Retrofitting those existing commercial buildings and then transitioning to zero emission commercial fleets. Now if you look at this list, most of this is in the private sector to some extent. The City of Ottawa certainly has the ability to influence emission reductions in these areas, but we don't have direct control over very many of these aspects. That's why it's important and that's why we recognize that everybody in Ottawa has a role to play in reducing these emissions, both at the municipal level, provincial and federal level, and for private individuals, businesses, organizations and institutions. So what are some of the ways that we are currently working right now to reduce emissions in Ottawa? Uh, we've got couple of programs on the building retrofit side. The first is the Better Homes Ottawa program. This is a program where the City of Ottawa offers low interest loans to support residential retrofits to reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. We also have the Better Buildings Ottawa program, which is overarching, an overarching strategy that includes five different components. It looks at education, it looks at regulation, it looks at uh, marketing, um, forgetting at least two of those. Luckily, over at the booth, uh, benchmarking, thank you Janice, that was regulation. Uh, over at our booth, we've got Aaron Thornell and Janice Ashworth. Uh, Janice leads the Better Buildings program and Aaron leads the Better Homes Ottawa loan program. If you're interested in that, please go over and see them. I've got a little bit more information on both of those coming up later. In the bottom right-hand corner, we have one of our first uh, zero emission buses. Uh, we brought four buses online last year. They have uh, about half a million kilometers on them right now, and we're set to expand uh, substantially. I believe there's 25-ish that are coming on by the end of this year, and then we ramp up to have a full electric fleet by 2036. Um, we've got a flow electric vehicle charger. 
We're looking at both public charging infrastructure uh, in the city for private use as well as electrifying our fleet. Uh, we're currently doing a green, uh, green fleet strategy for the city of Ottawa that's taking a portfolio look at uh, all of our vehicles within the city of Ottawa fleet and is uh, simultaneously building out the infrastructure to support the transition to electric vehicles or in some cases hybrids. Our biggest barrier right now seems to be supply chain in actually accessing the vehicles for a fleet scale. We've got a, a picture of a heat pump up there. We are doing a number of different projects at the city to convert um, gas boilers to electric boilers or convert gas furnaces to electric heat pumps. We're doing a deep energy retrofit on the Hintonburg Community Centre for anyone who's familiar with that building uh, with the support of Infrastructure Canada and the Green Inclusive Community Building Program. Uh, we've got um, a number of buildings that are doing measures, so rolling out a series of different things. And this is a picture of windows, using high performance windows in some of our facilities, uh, doing envelope improvements, replicating in a number of different ones. And then of course we're transitioning our, uh, our fleet itself. So that's a picture of one of our bylaw electric vehicles, which is uh, already operational and in service and is moving as well. Mentioned the uh, Better Buildings Ottawa program. This is one of the five different aspects of that program. It's a benchmarking and Ottawa program, uh, sorry, a benchmarking and auditing program, which supports building owners and operators to uh, identify opportunity, reducing emissions, and identify uh, energy improvements. Quick show of hands. Anybody in this room already? Great, I see at least one hand. Janice, you are going to have so many people, I hope, after this, oh, maybe a second hand, come and see you to learn more. If you have buildings over 20,000 square feet, uh, we, we are encouraging folks to voluntarily disclose their energy consumption for their buildings, energy and, and emissions consumption for their buildings. It's in line with the provincial requirements. Um, and there's a network of ambassadors that offer training, support, energy uh, portfolio analysis, uh, I'm not saying that right, apologies, um, uh, looking at the buildings, they do these energy hunts where they go through on a training level and work with other building owners and operators to try and create a supportive environment for learning about where improvements can be made. So we've got uh, about 75 different building owners and operators who have already signed up to the program and about 500 buildings who are voluntarily disclosing in Ottawa and we're hoping to continue building that. So please go over and visit with Janice Ashworth at the booth to learn more about information required and how you can participate in that program. On the other side of things, Ottawa is doing a number of actions to prepare for the changes we're already seeing and to become more resilient. Uh, as a city. Up in the top corner, uh, we've got our uh, water treatment plant, or sorry, our, water, our drinking water plants. Um, we're starting to shore up those water plants. In the floods that we had in 2017 and 2019, there was some compromises to those plants, so there is work underway to protect those plants. Uh, we've got work that's happening on this top corner uh, at our water and wastewater treatment plant, ROPEC. Uh, in the derecho, there was extended power outages, of course, and raw sewage that went into the Ottawa River as a result of those extended outages. Ottawa is working to island the, the plant uh, by using uh, resources on site in order to maintain the processing that's happening right now and island the plant for future outages. In this bottom left-hand corner, we've got some new equipment where we are breaking up ice on sidewalks because there is expected to be more freeze thaw and more ice rain uh, with our changing climate. And so even our operations are, and our equipment is changing substantially as part of our vehicle fleets. Um, in the middle, we've got uh, tree planting programs for community members and for organizations to naturalize existing areas to manage heat islands and to absorb stormwater and uh, runoff. 
And then in the bottom right corner, um, lots of programs related to managing uh, storm water on residential property, uh, slow it down and soak it up um, through our Rain Ready Ottawa program. And we also have a number of residential plumbing programs or back, uh, backwater valve programs at the city. Combination of incentives that the city offers, uh, e-training and uh, workshops with both industry and residential homeowners. So what's next? Uh, for the remainder of this year and into next year, there's a couple of things that we are, we are prioritizing. The first is we recently released the draft climate resiliency strategy. So we've taken the projections that we know are um, that w in the way that the, the climate is changing. We've identified the risks and vulnerabilities and we're bringing forward or we've released a strategy that says how we're going to address some of the highest risk or most vulnerable areas in the next couple of years. That strategy right now is available on Engage Ottawa for comment. Um, and we will come forward with a, um, a final strategy by the end of the year that includes the costing. Uh, for those of you in the room who are particularly interesting, interested in the costing, there's a great study that was done by the Financial Accountability Office of Ontario that looks at the cost of climate change on public infrastructure, specifically on buildings, roads, and uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. And that, that study uh, made us change the graph on, for our finance team. The numbers are so big around what the implications are for Ontario. The study used uh, data from Ottawa in an asset management capacity to figure out some of the costing aspects. And we've now extracted that data back out for Ottawa again to figure out some of the costing. And I think that there's some very interesting and important conversations coming in the next couple of years in Ottawa around the levels of service for infrastructure that we are going to strive for in order to balance some of these costs that have been identified by the Financial Accountability Office. High performance development standard. Um, for those of you, I know there's a couple in the room who are particularly interested. Council approved a high performance development standard for new buildings last year, and we are still waiting for Council to consider an implementation plan for that. We're waiting for the next uh, release of the Ontario Building Code. We anticipate it could be as early as this week. Um, and we are also waiting to see where uh, the implementation of, of the high performance development standard will align with those uh, building code updates. We intend to bring forward an electric vehicle strategy by the end of the year. This is really focused on what the City of Ottawa's role is in catalyzing the uptake of electric vehicles for uh, the, the public. Um, we have a separate green fleet strategy that deals with our own vehicles, but for the personal electric vehicle strategy, it's really looking at where we have levers uh, related to regulation, like zoning to require uh, electric vehicle ready buildings, and it looks at in the role of the city in providing public charging infrastructure for personal electric vehicles, particularly in areas where there are orphans, uh, garage orphans, so folks that don't have easy access to garages and charging on their own properties or in multi-residential contexts. And then uh, just next week, we're bringing forward the Rain Ready Ottawa program. It's a pilot program that's been used over the last three years to manage residential uh, stormwater um, on residential property. And we are recommending that that uh, incentive program be converted into a permanent program and expanded to deal with more areas of the city where uh, we've got water courses running into either the Rideau or the Ottawa River. And that goes to committee next week. In this, at the same time, we're working on the um, deep and difficult work of really embedding climate change in some very long-term policies or strategy documents at the City of Ottawa. Over the last number, number of years, we've been working to embed both the mitigation and adapt, adaptation considerations into our official plan, the overarching plan for the city that guides growth and development in the city for the next 25 years. And now that that official plan has been approved by council and by the province, we're working on embedding climate change considerations into all of the supporting master plans. 
the transportation master plans, infrastructure master plans, green space and forestry master plans, and solid waste master plans. Each of these, op uh, each of these represent opportunities to both take uh, the climate projections which we have and build them in so that we're looking at how to redesign, like our sewer design guidelines, how big should we be making them based on the projections for our, our rainfall, for instance. And our solid waste master plan, where are there potential for us to divert organics and perhaps make more renewable natural gas? Asset management plans are going to be a critical component for embedding climate change within municipalities in Ontario. Regulation introduced in uh, early, 2000, uh, early 2020s uh, required that all municipalities in Ontario plan for uh, climate change. And so critical infrastructure had to have uh, asset management plans with climate change considered in them by July of last year. Non-critical infrastructure requires it for July of this year. And these are all for our current levels of service, what, what we have historically been doing. By July of next year, all municipalities in Ontario have to share what their plans are for their future levels of service. And that's where aspects of mitigation and adaptation are going to become particularly important. And each of those asset management plans require costing. And so the costing for each of those asset management plans will feed into the City of Ottawa's long-range financial plans. And those long-range financial plans are what guide the City's annual investments in their budgets. So we continue to do the deep and difficult work of embedding climate change considerations throughout those documents for the City of Ottawa, ultimately with the goal of identifying and then disclosing the types of investments that the City of Ottawa is making in climate change. As part of that process, we are one of uh, a few municipalities across Canada who has started doing climate-related financial disclosures. We now report on how much, um, in, how, what, what kind of investments we're making in climate change, as well as the risks that we are uh, assuming by uh, with the investments that we have, either because we've addressed risks or because we have not addressed risks, risks appropriately. And we're seeing that this is an important driver within the financial sector right now in terms of the climate-related financial disclosures, and I'm particularly interested to see how this plays out over the long term for the City of Ottawa and other municipalities who have started these types of disclosures. And then for those of you who live in Ottawa, there's a new tool coming called the Better Homes Ottawa Portal. This is intended to launch sometime this summer where you'll be able to get a sense of uh, the energy and emissions for your house. You'll be able to see where it's, it is relative to others at a very high level using archetypes for the buildings. And then you'll be able to go in and add some data to that program so that you can start to see where potential opportunities are within your own, um, your own home. So that is something that I'm excited about to see because I think it's a really tangible tool to help people at an individual level start conversations. That's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, then as I said before, we've got uh, a couple of staff over here, Janice Ashworth and Aaron Thornell, who are at the, the booth in case you have any questions afterwards. But I am certainly happy to take questions from anyone here today about anything that I have or perhaps have not talked about that you're interested in today. Well, maybe expanding your question slightly. For those of you who couldn't hear it, I think it's fair to say the question was, um, what, what's the influence of the provincial government? You were asking specifically about electrification, but to broaden that question out, uh, there's a lot of provincial influence on a number of these aspects. Certainly from a building perspective, building code is, is an area where the province is making changes. As I said earlier, we hope to see those changes this week. There's been questions around whether the province is going to develop a provincial green development standard. Uh, there's a question around whether Ottawa would need one if the province was going to do that. At this point, we haven't seen any movement from the province on developing that. 
Obviously, from an electrification perspective, huge investments required province-wide and then at our local distribution uh, level as well for electrification. Uh, regulation and funding, certainly there's a number of aspects that, it, that fall under the authority of the province outside of the municipal authority. Uh, some of those are, for instance, for revenue generation. We are limited as a municipality and some of the ways that we could generate revenue that could offset some of these costs unless there are changes at the provincial level. So I don't have like a nice easy number or percentage to say that X percentage of our plan depends on the province, but more as a, a generality, there's a significant number of policy revenue and um, I would say infrastructure considerations at the prov provincial level, which will dictate how successful Ottawa can be. At the back, and then uh, one up. You, you mentioned earlier about the volunteer program, about the energy, uh, energy and benchmarking reporting. Um, we've heard recently that city, like city of Toronto, they made it like low that buildings, large buildings, they have to report. Is the city of Ottawa have any plans to, to move from voluntary to make it a mandatory program? We certainly would like to. Uh, so, so we are in the process of doing the voluntary disclosures, certainly across other municipalities, but it's been shown that regulation and mandatory benchmarking in and of itself is more efficient and effective than voluntary disclosures, both in terms of the number of people who are participating and disclosing, but more importantly, the amount of energy and emission reductions that you see. Um, We'd like to move towards mandatory benchmarking. There's more work to be done on the costing and also consultation around what the level of support for that kind of uh, move would be here in Ottawa. Again, it's part of the reason why it's so important to build people who are willing to voluntarily disclose at this point so that we can show uh, that there are folks who are willing and, and it's, as I think as you pointed out, in line already with uh, provincial requirements to disclose this information and some municipalities like Toronto which have mandated it. There was a question up here, yeah. Um, you mentioned um, city level, community, uh, corporate level emissions and community level emissions. Um, what are the strategies that are taking place within the city of Ottawa to reduce, to help reduce the community level emissions to be able to reach a target for 2050? Sure. So on the community side of things, uh, the question is what's the city of Ottawa doing to help reduce community emissions? Yeah. Uh, well, two of those programs that I mentioned, the Better Homes Ottawa Loan Program, that's a, a program that we've developed to reduce emissions and energy consumption for residential buildings, low interest for loans for residential properties. Those are, that's a big component of our emission reductions. Commercial buildings, that's the Better Buildings Program where we've got uh, network, networking events, um, uh, opportunities for uh, uh, energy hunts sort of at the building level to understand where there are opportunities and in individuals, the benchmarking that works at that. In time, as, as was asked, we'd like to see that move both to benchmarking, mandatory benchmarking, but in time also to mandatory building performance standards, as has been seen in some leading jurisdictions in North America. Uh, so those are on the kind of the building side of things on the, because 90% of our emissions come from buildings and transportation. On the transportation side, of course, the city doesn't have direct control over some areas, but we have tremendous influence. So our official plan looks to have more than a half of our trips made in some way other than personal vehicles. And our transportation master plan supports that, whether it's transit, cycling, walking, um, other, other options for sure. As a last resort, we see the personal vehicle and the shift to electric vehicles, and that's the personal electric vehicle strategy I was speaking about before. So in that case, how can we support the, um, the move or the catalyzing of uptake for personal vehicles? One of the most significant ways is charging infrastructure. When we ask what the barriers are, we routinely hear that the limited charging infrastructure may, is, may, is 
continues to be a barrier for people making the transition to electric vehicles. So investments in public charging infrastructure. That's buildings, transportation. And then on the community side, as you saw, uh, waste is another significant area where diverting organics to the extent possible is a significant feedstock that could be used for renewable natural gas generation in time. So we're current, we've, done a, we've done a feasibility study to look at what the potential is for our water and wastewater treatment plant. We're in discussions, ongoing discussions with the folks who are leading the solid waste master plan to figure out as the contracts come up for their organics processing, what the potential is to, uh, to generate renewable natural gas for that. So those are three, I would say, key areas um, where the city is playing a role in the, we'll call it the community space. Any other questions? There's one down here. What is the uh, city of Ottawa doing about the single family zoning? Is there any work being done uh, to address that, which would handle both the transportation side of things and the building side of things? Uh, the city of Ottawa is in the process to, of developing a, a new zoning bylaw. Uh, under the official plan, we've set very aggressive intensification targets, particularly within the urban areas. Uh, and the new zoning bylaw will reflect that. Uh, by right, the province has already changed some of those pieces, uh, allowing um, R3, so three units per property, separate from what the city does. Great, great example of where the province has moved the needle uh, without the city. <laughs> uh, and the zoning bylaw will go through and look at where intensification has already gone through, identified where growth and intensification areas are targeted. The, the zoning bylaw will start to put a finer grain on that, uh, where, what the heights are in different locations, uh, what the setbacks are, that kind of thing. I'm not sure, am I, am I answering your question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, we all know that the targets are fairly aggressive um, and we're set for 96 percent uh, by 2040 for the community level. Can you explain what you envision that last four percent uh, being and why you've given it 10 years? Oh, that's a good question. Um, why we get to 96 percent and then why 10 years to get to the last four? Yeah. I don't know offhand, I'm sorry to say. I think it's gonna be a combination of challenges in heavy duty fleet conversions, because they are way out for, for what our model looked at. Some of the conversions for our uh, buildings that are very difficult, so think heritage buildings for instance, even though our targets by the time we get there is like 98% conversion. Um, of retrofits for buildings. There are some that are gonna be very difficult, like heritage buildings that are have competing needs. And then our electricity system itself, as we start to look, where are there still emissions from our system? That's my best guess. I don't know, Janice, I'm looking over at you to see if there's anything else. Or Aaron? So predominantly the electric grid, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? They're getting harder as they go. Well, I'm happy to stick around if folks have any other questions. Uh, you've already seen the excellent uh, information available over at the booth. <laughs> Um, please go over and chat with Janice and Aaron about the Better Homes Ottawa Loan Program or the benchmarking program. And if you have any other general questions, I'm happy to take anything after this. Thank you very much for your attention and your questions.